There we go. Um, so, hi, I am Jennifer White with Colorado Fertility Advocates, and we are here for our COVID panel. I think all things COVID, whatever it comes to mind, we're going to talk about it, um, or we're going to let everybody else talk about it. Um, so, I'm, I, you know, nobody needs to know about me, quite honestly. I, you, you all need to go straight to the people who are speaking today. Uh, so, I'm going to just start off. We're going to go, we have four wonderful speakers. We're going to start with Dr. Allison Wilson and go to Dr. Drew Ambler, then go to Dr. Althea O'Shaughnessy, and finally, but last but definitely not least, to Dr. Anna User. Um, Dr. Wilson, we intentionally, just so everybody knows, we're keeping her section pretty short because we do want mental health because mental health is important through this, but we know what you're really here for. So. <laughs> Let's be honest. Um, right? So I'm going to just read a bio as I introduce you and um, we'll go from there. So Dr. Allison Wilson is one of only a handful of mental health specialists trained in reproductive health counseling in the Denver area. Throughout her close working relationships with fertility clinics, she has provided hundreds of individuals and couples guidance and support as they explore all family building options. She also helps women and with other areas of their reproductive lives, including PMS, high-risk pregnancies, miscarriage and pregnancy loss, pregnancy terminations, postpartum depression, and menopause adjustment. Dr. Wilson is a member of the American Society for Reproductive Medicine, and she is a board member of Colorado Fertility, Colorado Fertility Advocates and she did not update her bio. She is also a board member of Reproductive Alliance. So, <laughs> <That's> very true. <laughs> yes. So, without further ado, Dr. Wilson, take it away. Thank you. Thank you, Jen. So, yeah, my part's really brief. Uh, I feel like I'm preaching to the choir, but as if infertility wasn't stressful enough and wasn't full of anxiety and uncertainty, we throw a worldwide pandemic. And now we are in the midst of, you know, do I get vaccinated or not? And what I'm really finding from patients across the board are, are different areas of anxiety. The main one is reentry anxiety. It, it's so big that they have now a now name for it, reentry anxiety. Do I go here? Do I go there? But more for fertility patients and for families with very young children, it is, should I get this vaccine or not? And I'm just here to say there is nothing wrong with being anxious about something new. Um, but what can be problematic is, is letting your anxiety automatically you know, drive your decision making uh, instead of you actually making the decision. And so the best way I think is to, to deal with this anxiety is to recognize it, accept it, but then you really need to, to handle it more effectively. And the best way I know is due diligence so you can make an informed decision. And that's where I think for this topic, um, these, these experts, that's where you do your due diligence of listening to experts, to people you trust, um, not you know a headline or a magazine or a mom blog or somebody's you know, personal rant on this. It's really important to do that. And then uh, this is an invitation. After this webinar, I want you to think about what you heard and then you know, talk about it with somebody you trust who has your best interest at heart. And I think you will be on your way. So after that, uh, next speaker, so. Awesome, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so next we have uh, the Dr. Drew Ambler. And he has a, a mouthful of things for me on his bio, I'm just going to say. So I'm going to I'm going to stumble just a little bit because he went to some schools that I'm not sure I can pronounce. Um, <laughs> um, Drambler earned his Bachelor of Science degree in biology from is it Ursinus? Yep. Ursinus College uh, and his Doctorate of Osteopathic Medicine degree from Lake Erie College of Osteopathic Medicine. Following his residency in internal medicine at Genesis Regional Medical Center, Dr. Ambler completed a fellowship in infectious disease at Botsford General Hospital in Michigan. From there, Dr. Ambler went on to work in various private practices, including Colorado Infectious Disease Associates, and has set up numerous antibiotic steward stewardship programs for a wide variety of facilities, ranging from academic centers to small rural hospitals. His desire to give back to the osteopathic profession has brought him to Rocky Vista University College of Osteopathic Medicine, where he is now. Um, in his spare time, Dr. Ambler enjoys experimenting in the kitchen and increasing his collection of music and watches. He is an avid Phillies sports fan and enjoys spending time with his wife and two boys 
and also enjoys making pictures for our amusement in the background. So first off, what you have to announce what your picture is in your background before you launch into everything else. Uh, my pleasure. Thank you for that, man. It makes me sound like I actually, you know, maybe I've done some of that stuff. I don't know. Um, I also did another residency in neuromuscular medicine since that bio. So I'm actually like triple boarded now in some crazy crap just because I just can't stop, you know, getting more degrees apparently. Um, this right here is an electron microscopic, I can't do this backwards, it's like a video game, of coronavirus and it's little spike proteins, which we're gonna talk about today. Um, so yes, thank you. It's an honor to be speaking to all of you. Uh, thank you for that introduction. I have full disclosure, I have zero financial uh, uh, interest in anything that I'm saying today, including vaccines. Much to my dismay, I did not buy Pfizer or Moderna, you know, two years ago when it was on the radar screen that maybe something's coming. Um, I'm also disclosing that I'm married to an OBGYN, so I was told in no uncertain terms, I better not screw this up. Uh, there will be consequences. <laughs> Although she's not watching, so I don't know how she's going to find out. So you guys are all mum, you know, we'll what stays in this webinar. Right. Right yeah. Um, and I, what, what I want to try to do, and I'm going to, I'm going to nail you with a lot of info, but I want to get everybody on a level playing field so that you can ask the appropriate questions as it pertains to you, your situation. Uh, you know, if you don't have the basic background, how do you understand the ramifications or the recommendations? So I, I'll be sticking around for some questions. I'm sure there will be, but I'm going to, like I said, tee up the other speakers because that's what you're all here for. Um, first off, COVID-19, uh, I want to be on the same page as, as far as what this means. It actually is an acronym. It stands for Coronavirus Identified in 2019. Um, it's actually the virus itself is not COVID. And this is, and I know it's semantics, but I want you guys, in case you, you come across this, the virus is actually SARS-CoV-2, which stands for Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome, CoV for coronavirus 2, which suggests that there was SARS-CoV-1, which we did see back in 2003, 2004 in China, but it didn't become a pandemic. So we need to talk about how the immune system works and how that relates to vaccine and do you vaccinate or do you not vaccinate? And really you get protection, you get immunity to something really one of two ways. You get infected with something and you, you create an immune response and you get protective antibodies or you get a vaccine which essentially confuses the body into thinking it got infected with something to create a response to make protective antibodies. So now the real question, and this is for anything in life, I think, but especially medicine, you have to be informed to understand risk versus benefit. And that's what I'm gonna spend a little bit of time today talking to you about what are the actual risks? What are the actual benefits? And then you have to make that ultimate decision for you, your loved ones and your family. I'm not here to browbeat anybody today, but as you can guess, I'm a little biased. <laughs> So how did we get here? Well, coronaviruses are, are we, we know about them. They're like the, they've been considered the second most common cause of the common cold. All right. There was a nice little uh, uh, cartoon that I remember when I was in med school of a rhinoceros sitting at a bar drinking a Corona because the two viruses that cause a common cold are the rhinovirus and coronavirus. So think of a rhinoceros blowing his nose while drinking a Corona and that's where the common cold comes from. But like all kinds of viruses and other things, every couple generations, a new strain comes along and humans have never seen it. We're all susceptible to it and it can hit us really hard because we've never had any protection against it. And these are the ones that cause pandemics, which is what we're in right now. So how do you combat that? Well, vaccines is actually one of the mainstays for this. And to give you a little bit of a background, it takes on average about four to six years before a vaccine comes to market you know, with all the testing and all that. And to give you another example, measles took over 35 years to get right. So it can be a long time. So how the heck did we get multiple ones in about a year or less? Well, we actually didn't. And so I want to let you guys know that this, you know, especially the mRNA technology of Pfizer and Moderna, which I'll talk about in a minute, is not new technology. We were actually using this in labs in the 90s. And it wasn't until about 2005 that we actually developed the ability to sort of edit and make it exactly what we want and put a little protective shell around it so we could get it into mammalian 
uh, cells to create an immune response. So the, the, the mRNA vaccine was sitting on the shelf waiting for a home. We'd used it in little other stuff, but waiting for a vaccine home. And then coronavirus came. So we jumped on that because we said, hey, this is a perfect marriage. Now, there's a third vaccine, the Janssen, Johnson & Johnson one-shot vaccine, which uses a similar motif, but it actually uses adenovirus to get a DNA into the cell to create mRNA. And then they are exactly the same. And let me tell you a little bit about that right now. I'm going to talk about influenza vaccine. You're going to be like, wait a minute. What are you doing? Well, it, it'll explain how we got to where we are so fast. How does the influenza vaccine work? Well, what we do is much like a, vi a coronavirus, we have these spike proteins on coronavirus, which are these outer little doohickeys hanging out. Look on my picture. And uh, influenza has the same thing, but we actually target something called hemagglutinin on the influenza. And what we do is we use chicken eggs to mass produce hemagglutinin molecules, which we then extract make into a vaccine, jack it into a, a needle and put it into your body as a, as a vaccination. What is that doing? Well, your immune system says, hey, what is this foreign thing that just came flying into my system? You're not part of me. It does three things. It, it tries to sequester it, it tries to kill it, and it tries to create the factory to make protective antibodies in case it ever sees it again. It takes care of it without you even knowing it. That is the whole process, all right? So, these mRNA vaccines do the exact same thing. The only difference is, is we actually put the little blueprint of the spike protein, that little outer protein on the coronavirus into your system and you let the cell be the factory, not the chicken egg. Cuts out the middleman, much more efficient. You can bring that to market really fast. It doesn't take the six months that it takes for influenza, all right? So the mechanism has been there. The details in the beginning are a little different. So this is, quote, new technology, but it's not really new technology. <laughs> I hope that makes sense. So then, the, then it begs the question, oh man, you're talking about genetics. That's scary when we're talking about, you know, especially people trying to get pregnant or pregnant and things like that. Well, the beauty of this is that one, coronavirus doesn't do this and neither do the vaccine. It can't mess with your own DNA. It doesn't have the mechanism. It needs it would need something extra to be able to come in, cut your own DNA, insert this into it, and then sew it back together so that it can replicate and cause, you know, be there for later generations of that cell, or if we think about it, the sperm or the egg. It, since it doesn't have that ability and mRNA gets degraded really fast and DNA is just slightly less fast, um, this doesn't have any long lasting effect. It doesn't stay around in the body. It doesn't interrupt the DNA that's already in your sperm or already in your, your egg. So it doesn't have a chance of being inherited, if you will, as a mutation. And it's designed that way. And, and it's, it's actually been looking like it proved exactly the way we wanted it to do. It doesn't have that mechanism. You need a whole bunch of enzymes and all kinds of other stuff to do that stuff. So so now we got to talk about, well, what's the risk of, of this actual disease, COVID, versus the problems or the, the concerns with the vaccine? And I'm going to say, when you look at the data, and I'm going to show you the numbers here in a second, or talk about the numbers in a second, the data seems to completely favor the safety of the vaccine over the actual infection. Here's, here's my evidence for that, if you want to take it that way. There's been an estimated 33 million people that have COVID in this country. That's one tenth the population. There's been, forget about the, the controversy, about a half a million deaths because of it. Overall, it's estimated one in six people that get coronavirus get a severe case, which means hospitalization, intubation on, on a ventilator or death. Now, I need to say this because this is this has not changed. Pregnancy is an independent risk factor for severe disease. It doesn't mean you may get it more, but if you do get it, you have a chance of it being worse, okay? Now, we're gonna compare those numbers to the vaccination numbers we have. We have things like VAERS and VSAFE out there that are tracking every vaccine and adverse reaction, and you know if you're pregnant, if you're not, and all that. So as of this week, there's been an estimated 272 million doses given in the United States. Currently, the reports of anaphylaxis, which are an immediate allergic reaction. So if anybody's gotten a vaccine and they've had to sit there for 15 minutes, we're waiting to see if you have an anaphylactic reaction. 
the rate of that is 2.8 to 5 people per million doses. That's not a high number. I want to put this into perspective for you. The rate of anaphylaxis for giving a prescription of an antibiotic is one in 5,000. Okay, These, this is a staggering difference in numbers. The other adverse reaction we're seeing has to be with the, the Johnson & Johnson adenovirus, uh, which is central venous sinus thrombosis or vein clots in the brain. It's a specific type of clotting. It can be devastating. Three people have died out of the 28 that have been reported. Now, let's put that into perspective. This is higher than the baseline in the 15 to 45 year old female that it happens naturally. This is higher than that, but it's still pretty low because 28 people have been reported and 8.7 million doses have been given. So look at the, if you look at the, what happens with COVID and severe disease compared to these adverse reactions, that's why they're saying these are relatively safe vaccines, even compared to other vaccines. But let's look at the, even further, the potential damaging effects of COVID. We're finding that people even with mild disease with COVID are having longstanding effects and we don't know how bad it's gonna be over their lifetime. For instance, in the heart, we're showing that damage to the heart muscle has been happening and some scarring is happening. You don't recover scarring. Scarring is like an end stage. That tissue's damaged, the scars laid down, it's not gonna function right after that. And we're finding people with mild disease are still having evidence of heart muscle damage. Same thing with the lung. It's an inflammatory response. We're finding scarring of the lung and people are having exercise intolerance, hypoxic issues. You know, I feel short of breath more than I used to. And this is long lasting. Central nervous system. It's been linked to strokes. So that's clots in the brain. Seizures, Guillain-Barre, which is a demyelinating disease which believe it or not is actually a risk that you get with vaccination. So that's interesting. We're actually seeing it more with COVID than the vaccine. And then I'm getting a ton of people who have had COVID coming to me complaining. It, I'm all better except for fatigue and memory issues, the memory fog, sort of this cognitive. They're just, it's a little slow up in the brain. And we're seeing that this is a CNS effect. Um, you can also get blood clots to vital organs like kidneys and liver. And then the last is long lasting COVID symptoms. The aches, the, fa the fatigue is the big one. Um, usually the fever and chills goes away. They just don't feel right. Maybe some muscle, muscle aches as well. So then the question is, is, well, all right, all right, you're laying something out. What happens if you've had COVID? Do you need to get the vaccine? And, you know, there's not a definitive answer, but everything seems to be pointing to, yes, it's a very good idea to get the vaccine, even if you've had COVID. Studies have been done and they're showing that when you get the vaccine, you actually get up to 10 times the amount of antibody production, protective antibody production that you do from an actual illness. So you actually get better immunity from the vaccine than actually getting COVID. And higher antibody levels actually will help you because it takes longer for them to wane. So it, it pretends that you're gonna get longer lasting protection, longer immunity. Now, okay, so, so that's the case. And, we're, and I showed you the data that the severe complications of vaccine are, are not really there in great, great numbers. But what about side effects of the vaccine? Well, absolutely, we're seeing that. I'm sure you've heard about it, especially that second shot. Usually we're gonna get vaccine side effects at the second shot. Maybe the first shot, if, especially if you've had COVID before because you've already primed the pump. What are they gonna be? Well, muscle ache from getting the shot. Um, they're also going to be maybe some of those inflammatory symptoms. I love when people tell me I can't get the flu shot because it gives me the flu. I'm like, no, it means your body is reacting to it the way we want it to. It's creating a response and you're getting protective immunity. So we're going to see that sort of same thing with these vaccines. Sometimes people are going to complain of fever, chills, generalized aches, like they're coming down with something, maybe some GI. Headache is a big one. Interestingly, the two things missing from the vaccine are no respiratory, so you don't get any lung symptoms and you're not losing your, your taste and your smell. It usually lasts a day or so. And then a lot of people, it's like a light switch. They flick the light switch and they feel perfectly fine. It happens almost instantaneously. Rarely do we get stuff into a week. The problem is we don't know who's gonna get symptoms and who don't. Uh, you know, Some people have zero symptoms and other people are like, dear Lord, put a bullet in my head. You know, I don't know who, and most people are somewhere in between. But again, lasts a day or two and it's gone. 
how long does the, does the immunity last? Well, or how long does it take to get immunity? It's, it's really the recommendation right now is two weeks um, after your last shot. So that means two weeks after your second shot of Pfizer or Moderna or, or two weeks after your Johnson & Johnson shot. Um, that's usually when the factory is really up and running and we think you have enough protective antibodies at that point. Does it last long? Well, we know it lasts at least six months based on the studies. Um, but if we look at SARS-CoV-1 with natural infection, it lasted two to three good years, maybe a little bit longer. And then you take that with, we're getting a 10 time antibody response in the vaccine. We may be having a long lasting uh, immunity here. The one caveat that I have to say is, um, we're not sure how this is gonna work over the next six months to a year because there's variants out there. The, you know, the UK variant you may have heard of, the South African variant, the Brazil Tokyo P1 variant, the two California variants and some other ones. They seem to be a little more contagious. So we need to have a local, uh, a statewide, a national and a global effort to really do all we can, vaccination and mitigation, to not allow that to really become a big stronghold because that may force us to get a booster or a reformulation of the vaccine. Now, the good news is the technology for the mRNA vaccines is they can change it within the week, literally within the week. So it's not all doom and gloom, but it may force us to at least reformulate and get a different type of coronavirus shot. Um, I have been blabbing a lot. I hope I generated some questions, but uh, that hopefully gives a tee up for, for the next two speakers. And I believe Dr. O'Shaughnessy is up next. So I, I will, let me, yeah, and, let me introduce her. You did, and, oh, you did say, let Jennifer uh, introduce her. Yeah. And, uh, I'll you did around. fantastic Thanks. considering the uh, number of questions I threw at you to try to get done in 15 minutes. So <laughs> good <Ooh>. job, <laughs> incredible job, quite honestly. Um, so we next, next to speak is gonna be Dr. Althea O'Shaughnessy. She is board certified in both obstetrics and gynecology and reproductive endocrinology and infertility. She obtained her BS degree from Trinity College before achieving her MD from the University of Rochester School of Medicine and Dentistry. She completed her OBGYN residency at the University of Connecticut Health Center. Ooh, ooh for UConn. Um, she has been <laughs> followed by a fellowship in reproductive endocrinology at Downstate Medical Center in New York. She has been practicing at reproductive in reproductive endocrinology and infertility since 1988 at impressive facilities such as Mount Sinai Hospital, Cooper Center for IVF in New Jersey, and Share Institute for Reproductive Medicine in New York. She was also the medical director of the Princeton Center for Infertility and Reproductive Medicine for 20 years. Dr. O'Shaughnessy has been long recognized by her peers and her patients for her outstanding dedication. She's been recognized for her work in reproductive endocrinology as best in medicine by the American Health Council in 2019. She received the Castle Connolly Top Doctor Award in 2010, 2011, 2012, 2013, 2014, 2015, and 2017. Dr. O'Shaughnessy began publishing and presenting her reproductive medicine findings in 1986 and has over 40 papers and presentations to her credit. And now we get to hear her and be presented to as well. So thank you, Dr. O'Shaughnessy. Thank you. Well, I'd like to thank uh, the Colorado Fertility Advocates for inviting me uh, to discuss this very important topic about COVID-19 vaccination and as it relates to both men and women uh, with fertility issues. Um, I wanted to start off by uh, this presentation by saying that several medical societies have advocated for women for vaccination in both men and women who are trying to conceive. And in women who are already pregnant, which I'm sure we'll be discussing later at any stage of their pregnancies. These societies include the American Society for Reproductive Medicine, the World Health Organization, the American uh, College of Obstetrics and Gynecology, the Society for Maternal Fetal Medicine. So why this unanimous support for vaccination? It's very simple. The risk of contracting COVID-19 and its potential serious health related sequelae as Dr. Ambler uh, outlined, far outweighed the complications from receiving the COVID-19 vaccination. We can all understand the hesitancy surrounding that, especially related to possible adverse effects on fertility and pregnancy. This he hesitancy is generated by the fear of the unknown. These vaccines are new and although they have been accepted for release by the FDA for emergency 
use, long-term potential effects in select populations, particularly in pregnant women, have not been adequately studied. Hesitancy also comes from myths or misinformation generated by the social media. Anti-vaxxer sites have been around for a long time and now have added COVID-19 vaccines to their list of quote unquote dangerous vaccinations. Misinformation not founded on sound scientific data began to go viral on social media presenting anecdotal information surrounding COVID-19 vaccination and potential adverse effects on fertility. These sites claim that the SARS CoV-2 spike protein, that's the virus that we're talking about, SARS CoV-2 spike protein, has a portion of its genetic material that was similar to a portion of the placental protein, syncytion one, thereby proposing that following the COVID vaccination, the resultant antibody response to the spike protein would then cause antibodies to the placenta protein and lead to potential placental rejection and adverse effects on pregnancy and the ability to conceive. This claim is completely false. And these two proteins are structurally very, very different. The COVID-19 vaccination in no way induces an immune re reaction against the placenta and thereby does not cause issues with fertility. There actually has been absolutely no uh, studies to suggest that uh, fertility has become more of an issue when people um, have been vaccinated and also people with, uh, with, uh, who have had the uh, virus. The second myth has been, uh, has been generated is related to quote unquote shedding. This information on social media are claiming that vaccinated people are actually shed the COVID spike protein, which in turn affects women who are pregnant and those trying to conceive. Um, and um, as indicated, the COVID vaccine is not a live virus. It's an mRNA virus and does not affect the cellular DNA as Dr. Ambler explained. And only the, it, it only allows for this immunological response to lead to immunity to the SARS-CoV-2 uh, SARS uh, virus. So many people around the world are fully vaccinated. There have been no scientific reports of adverse effects on fertility rates by COVID vaccination or by the viral infection itself. One issue that should be discussed, however, is the effects of COVID infection on sperm. Although we don't know if uh, the actual virus is found in the semen, and there have been various reports that say, yes, it's been found. Other reports, it says, no, it hasn't. And likewise, they've done autopsies on men who have had uh, severe COVID and have found uh, COVID, uh, the SARS-CoV uh, virus there. However, most of the effect of COVID on uh, men's sperm is related to the high fever that these men have with a severe uh, COVID-19 virus infection. So any, any infection, if you have the flu or any type of, of illness that causes a high fever, uh, generally what happens is it affects uh, the sperm quality and quantity. And um, this fortunately does resolve within three to six months. However, in my practice, when, uh, when someone comes in, one of the questions we ask um, is, have you been sick recently? Have you had a high fever? Have you had COVID? Um, and then we always recheck their semen analysis. And we have seen a, a big drop in, in the quality of the analysis. Again, this is temporary men make sperm all the time. And so this is not a permanent effect on, uh, on their fertility. Uh, one of the common questions that I get is, when is it safe to be vaccinated when I'm in a treatment cycle? And I say, anytime it's safe. So anybody should get vaccinated, um, and whether they're trying to get pregnant or are already pregnant. However, there is a caveat to that. So um, as you know, there can be significant side effects associated with the, with the vaccine. You can have a high fever, you can feel really crappy, I know when I got my vaccine, I was sick for about 36 hours. 
if I had to go do an egg retrieval, I probably would not be, have been able to do it. So what, I, what we're recommending, um, and I think most fertility clinics are, are recommending the same thing, is not to try not to get a vaccine three days prior to or three days after any kind of treatment, um, that being uh, an egg retrieval, a, an embryo transfer, or an IUI. Again, the, the vaccine itself would not harm you or the, the embryo or anything. It's just, you probably wouldn't be able to get out of bed to go do these uh, procedures. Um, so um, in conclusion, um, I just wanna read you a quote from the American Society for Reproductive Medicine COVID Task Force. And this is a task force that was developed specifically for uh, COVID. And this is from their most recent April statement. And it says, quote, everyone, including pregnant women and those seeking to become pregnant should get a COVID-19 vac vaccine. Vaccines are safe and effective. Now, um, because the newly released J&J &J vaccine has been associated with rare, serious, life-threatening side effects in women less than, age 30, uh, less than age 50, the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology is recommending that pregnant women and women uh, in this age category, younger women, preferably should receive the Pfizer or Moderna vaccine if those are readily available. Obviously, if they're not available, you only have J and J, then uh, they, they're recommending vaccination with the J and J. So that's all I got. Um, if you have any questions, obviously we're taking questions at the end of the presentation. Awesome, thank Thanks. you, Dr. O'Shaughnessy. I say that ASRM statement always has been my favorite because up until then they've been updating it every whatever and it, they were five 10 15 page long you know pieces on that and that one was two sentences it was exactly. fantastic <laughs> exactly i loved it all right like i said last but definitely not least um dr anna user um dr anna user joined the maternal fetal medicine division at the university of colorado in 2016. She received her medical degree from the University of Vermont College of Medicine. She completed her OBGYN residency at the University of Minnesota and MFM fellowship training at the University of Colorado. Dr. User is the division's expert in viruses during pregnancy and being, and being the lead MFM in both Zika protocols and active in education on COVID and vaccines for the section. She also has a special interest in the effects of living at altitude on pregnancy physiology and preeclampsia and the effects of magnesium sulfate. Like that, that one, just, that one, I was like, I, I'm, I'm curious, on per, I'm like, what, magnesium sulfate, that's just a separate one. <laughs> so take it away, Dr. User. <laughs> Thank you for that introduction and for the ability to be here with you all today. Um, the magnesium sulfate dates back to grad school. I actually did a PhD as well during my um, time at University of Vermont, and that was my project was giving um, little rats some magnesium sulfate and seeing what it did to them during pregnancy. And as anybody who's gone through OBGYN residency knows, that is the one thing that we do for preeclampsia. And we use probably more magnesium sulfate in the hospital than any other service combined. So it's a very awesome. obstetrically specific thing for uh, preeclampsia. <laughs> so that's where that comes from. So uh, my disclosures to start out this with, um, I'm a new parent. I'm still in the sleep deprived stage of things. So if I have some word finding difficulties or uh, seem to be searching for something, it's, I'm gonna blame it on my daughter who turns 16 weeks tomorrow. Um, and that's also part of my disclosure as well is that I was uh, pregnant during all of this, both I, so I did IVF, I did my transfer in May. And so I was pregnant for pretty much all of COVID working in the hospital and also making the decisions about getting vaccinated or not um, for myself and received vaccine doses at 32 and 35 weeks of pregnancy before delivering. So kind of been at it from both sides, both as a provider and also as a patient making some of these decisions for myself. So that's kind of where my very particular interest comes in. Um, as mentioned before, it, you know, all of our professional organizations have really supported these vaccines as safe in pregnancy. And as Dr. Ambler so well put out, these risks are there with these vaccines, but they are so incredibly small compared to the risks of COVID, especially COVID for women who are pregnant. And so the data is continuing to change in the exact numbers, but what we know at this point and in what I've experienced as a provider taking care of these patients in the hospital is that if you looked at 100 women who are pregnant in the age group of women that get pregnant versus 100 women who are not pregnant, 
if they get COVID, the pregnant women are twice as likely to have those serious complications that nobody wants, which is being in the ICU, being on a ventilator, requiring epic, heroic, life-saving things to try to keep them alive. And so it's very real that if a pregnant woman gets COVID, there's a chance for severe complications, which could both threaten her life and by threatening her life, then threaten the baby's life, depending on where they're at in pregnancy. And so these are very real risks to those of us taking care of pregnant patients in a critical setting. And so when there's the opportunity to have something that so dramatically decreases the risk of getting COVID, it's really advantageous and welcome to have that out there. And that's why all the professional organizations have come out so strongly across the board of saying, we really think about this. They've come short in many cases of flat out recommending it because they really want to recognize that each patient has the autonomy and the independence to make their own health decisions for themselves. But they've really supported these vaccines and um, tried the best as we all are to, you know, curb some of these myths and kind of alternative theories that are out there about consequences that are there because we've used vaccines in pregnancy for a really long time to protect moms and babies. And this is just an extension of that. And as Dr. Ambler explained, the rapidity of getting this vaccine is not in any way make it more concerning or more threatening or more, you know, suspect in how we use vaccines in pregnancy. So just along that line, many women who are pregnant will get asked to be asked, should be asked about the flu vaccine every year because we, our professional organizations for many years have recommended that women get the flu vaccine during pregnancy because women get very sick from the flu and can get sicker than their non-pregnant counterparts. And we saw that in 2013 with H1N1 that women who were pregnant were ending up at IC, in ICUs at a much higher rate than any other population. So we know that pregnant women can get sicker from some of these things. And we've used the flu vaccine for a long time to try to protect their patients. And it also has benefits for the babies as well if their moms receive the flu vaccine during pregnancy. Similarly, since I was a resident, it's been about 10 to 15 years now, but we've been recommending the pertussis or whooping cough vaccine for every pregnant woman during pregnancy. And that's basically just to use the immune system's ability to get those antibodies from the mom's body that her immune system makes to that vaccine and get them across the placenta to the baby. And so we've used this idea of moms getting something and using mom's immune system to protect the baby well before this came up with COVID. And so all of these principles have been used in other ways and it's just doubly advantageous that we're able to use the vaccine to protect mom and baby. And so there's been numerous studies that have shown that the placenta allows these antibodies across and that these antibodies from the vaccine and or if a woman had COVID, that these antibodies are present in the baby's bloodstream. And that's entirely expected. It's, it was a great proof of concept when this was demonstrated, but no one in our field was surprised to see that these antibodies were present in the baby's circulation or in the placenta. Similarly, breastfeeding is another way that the mom's immune system can help to protect baby. And so antibodies in a different way are passed through breast milk and help to help baby's immune system fight off diseases in the early part of their lives before their immune system is up and running and before they're old enough to get any vaccines themselves. And so COVID has just continued to demonstrate that it's acting like a virus in some ways differently than other viruses we've seen in the past, but in the basic immunology perspective, it's been operating very similarly as far as how the immune system responds to vaccines, how the vaccines can help protect the mother, and how the vaccines can help to protect the babies. And so, you know, those have all been really, really assuring what we have to date. As Dr. O'Shaughnessy said, we don't have a lot of information. We are all in the early days of figuring all of this out. And so, you know, a lot of women are hesitant to take a vaccine that we don't have years of data on. My bottom line is, I don't have great data for almost anything I tell you about in pregnancy because for many years, they've been afraid to include pregnant women in any study of anything. And it's become sort of a backhanded protectionist thing where we, we're trying to protect moms and babies, but we're actually not doing them any favors by not including them in these studies because then I can't tell you if anything's ever safe or not because that's never been studied directly. So we, we kind of come at a lot of safety data in pregnancy from the back door anyway. So the fact that that's how we've started to get information about this and pregnancy doesn't surprise us. And, you know, many of us would have wanted pregnant women to be included in the initial studies that Pfizer was running and that Moderna was running and all the other companies, but that's just not the way things tend to work in this country. So the fact that they're including those women now is great. And the data that we have so far is what's called the VSAFE um, data. And that's been the CDC collecting data on women who have identified themselves as pregnant when they got the vaccine. So there's a voluntary enrollment 
when you get the vaccines to identify yourself in the in their database and to identify yourself as pregnant. My other disclosures, the closest I will ever get to being published in New England Journal of Medicine is being one of the 35,000 study participants <laughs> for the BeSafe data that was published about two weeks ago. Um, I don't think I will ever get closer to being in the New England Journal, but I was one of their 35,000 data points in that trial, which also though lets me say that they are doing a pretty detailed data collection on us. I mean, I don't know if I was in a subset or not, but I've gotten three phone calls from the CDC in Atlanta, personally going through my medical history with me, personally going through the events of my delivery, the health of my daughter since delivery. So they're doing their very best to collect the data that they can to try to help show what we do know, add to that data as we go. To this point, we don't see any huge problems with safety with this vaccine. Are pregnant women getting the same side effects that non-pregnant people are getting? Yes, so they're getting fever and chills when they get the vaccine, they're getting pain at the ejection site, they're getting headaches, they're tired, but none of those things have been out of proportion to what we have seen in non-pregnant people getting the vaccine. And we have not seen any pregnancy complications. Now that data comes with us asterisk because the, so far the data that was collected was those of us who got the vaccine from December to the end of February. Most people in that time period were in the end of their pregnancy as far as what data we have about outcomes of pregnancy. So we still, you know, the women that got it early in the pregnancies, we still, they're still pregnant. So we don't know what the outcomes for them are and if there's gonna be any concerns, but we don't anticipate that based on our experience with other vaccines and pregnancy. As far as the timing of it, in theory, there's a little bit of a concern about really high fevers in the first trimester because of some of the organs that are forming for the baby at that point. However, generally those are fevers that are well outside the bounds of what would be the low grade fever that most people experience when they get a vaccine or a vaccine reaction. And it is perfectly fine to take Tylenol in pregnancy, and it's perfectly fine to take Tylenol either before or after your dose of one of the vaccines if you do have the, um, if you have any fever. So that is a strategy that's appropriate. And again, most of the fevers that people are getting are nowhere near high enough for us to really be concerned about uh, the effects of the heat or the body heat of the mom on the baby developing. So similar to what others have said, when people ask me about timing of the vaccine, I say, when you can get it. If you can get it tomorrow and you're eight weeks pregnant, I would say, go get it tomorrow. Because luckily we're having a pretty good availability of vaccines, but in, especially in the early days, we didn't know that. And in other countries, that's not necessarily the case. So my advice is get it when you have access to it. With the concerns about the J&J &J vaccine and these very rare clots, if you knew you had a thrombophilia, which is something that makes you more at risk to have blood clots and you're pregnant, which can increase your risk for blood clots, and you had free, easy access to any of the vaccine, and then I maybe wouldn't pick the J&J &J vaccine. However, if that's the only one being offered in your community, the risk of you having a complication from it from a clot is still so much lower than even taking birth control pills or other things that we do in life without much thought to it that raise our clot risk. I would still do it. That being said, if someone came to me and said, I can have access to all three of them tomorrow, maybe I wouldn't pick J&J, &J, but not to the level of discarding that as an option if I had no other out, if I had no other um, ability to get the other two. Um, and as far as breastfeeding goes, again, we think it's very safe. We want the antibodies in the breast milk. We want that help for baby. So I don't discourage anyone who's postpartum to wait to a certain point in the postpartum period anyway. Particularly, there's many women who breastfeed for up to a year, if not past the year, and into two, three years of their child's life. And so that would be a very long period of time that they wouldn't have access to a very strong protection from the vaccine. And I don't think it's fair to say that they shouldn't be able to do it or that they should be afraid to do it during that whole period that they're breastfeeding their child. So um, again, like everyone, I, I hope to help dispel any myths make people feel confident to have the information to make their own decisions and would be happy to answer any questions. Awesome, thank you. So I probably should have invited people earlier that if you have questions, you are welcome to type them in the chat box or also if somebody wants to unmute themselves and quite honestly, just ask the questions directly, I am more than happy to do that. But if you message me directly, then in, if you're embarrassed or something like that, I'd be happy to <laughs> read them out. Um, while I wait for anybody to raise their hand or send me questions, um, I know some people sent a few in the background, and I think you guys addressed pretty well most of them. 
Um, I think the one, and I, I think you kind of touched on it, Dr. O'Shaughnessy, but I'd love to just run back at it again, is that in regards to fertility, how can an assessment be made on how much the vaccine could affect fertility so early in the distribution process? Um, okay. Um, again, uh, I, there have, it, this is, there's been so many studies looking at uh, the virus. Where is the virus? Does the virus affect eggs, follicles? And to be honest with you, the only thing that has been found again is that the virus has been found in uh, sperm and, and in the testicles. Um, but there has been no evidence that the, this virus can be transmitted via sexual intercourse. So if the virus is not found on eggs, in the follicles, um, then obviously that's what makes an embryo. Um, so again, um, the actual virus itself is far worse than getting a, a vaccine. The vaccine just mounts an antibody response. And that's why we're very confident that if the virus is not affecting these things, then definitely the vaccine is not going to affect these things. Um, is, does that make sense? Um, so um, I don't think there's any specific data looking at um, the effects of the actual COVID um, vaccine on the embryo itself, but I can't imagine that there would be any effects since there, again, has not been found in the egg, in the follicle, probably doesn't affect the, the actual sperm itself. Excellent. Um, so I'm not seeing any others come in yet. And so I'm gonna, I'll pause for a moment and let if anybody wants to take- Jennifer, I was just gonna piggyback on what Dr. O'Shaughnessy yeah, said. I think the, the question ask, askers point in some point is true. We don't, we can't answer any of these questions about long-term effects hundred percent because we are early on in this using the vaccine and we don't know that. But based on all of the vaccine knowledge we have from other types of vaccines, and the methodology and the science of how these vaccines work in the human body, we don't anticipate there being any concerns. And so I think that's where everybody feels so confident in recommending these and saying that they're safe is that the biology and the, the scientific plausibility of, of an effect there is so small that even though we don't have perfect data to say that, A, we're never gonna have perfect data because you just can't run studies like that. And people, you know, you can't pit one clone of a person to, against their other clone of a person to find out things but we just don't have, there's no reason to suspect that it would affect certain biological processes going forward. So it's, it's mostly our background knowledge of vaccines and how they work and why we feel very confident in saying that we have very, very low concern for some of these, these outcomes. Um, I do have a question that came through. Um, it says, can the vaccine affect how we respond to fertility treatment? For example, can it affect the medications that we are given to, you know, for embryo transfer or for, you know, retrieval or things like that? I, I can't even think of a way that that could possibly happen, to be honest with you. Um, and two different, you know, two different things, apples and oranges. Um, again, the, the vaccine is, is mounting an antibody response um, these fertility medications basically act directly on the ovary to stimulate um, follicle growth, which I guess maybe there is some immunological link there, but uh, we have not found that to be the case. And I fortunately, I have to say, most of my patients have been vaccinated or are looking to be vaccinated. There has been very few that are, are hesitant to vaccinate. And we have not found any difference in how people are responding to fertility medications after they've had COVID or after they've been uh, vaccinated. Excellent. Um, so one of the questions that came in in advance, and I think that we all as a group kind of went back and forth and talked about this. And I think I'm gonna pitch it kind of towards you, Dr. Ambler, to talk about the the, the background on it and go a little more in depth in how vaccine works on this. But so the question was, there have been reports of women having irregular bleeding who had not received the vaccine, but have been in close proximity to people who have. What could be the cause of this? And should I be concerned? And I, I brought up, and I think one of the things I, that made me realize where the logical 
point can come from for people on this, and this is why I want Dr. Ambler to go back and talk about it, is that years ago, my husband, who's in the military, had to have the smallpox vaccine, and I was pregnant. And at the time, and it still is true, if you're exposed to somebody who has had within 30 days of the smallpox vaccine, there is some level of shedding, and you as a pregnant person should not be around that person. And so I... I assume that there's somebody's making a logical connection there. So do you mind explaining the difference and why that vaccine is that way and why the COVID vaccine is different so that people can have the, the self-intelligence to be able to refute that, you know, when they see those rumors? Absolutely. So, yeah, I, I can't speak to the irregular menses, but yeah, so there's multiple ways. We only talked about really one way of creating an immune response in both the mRNA vaccine, I talked about influenza as a comparable one, and the Johnson & Johnson adeno human 26 strain DNA vaccine. Though that's just one way to do this. You know, we used to rely on live attenuated viruses, which are really weakened, full, alive-like or reproducible-like viruses. And then we started beating them up a little bit more, and we the, we call these inactivated whole viruses. And then, um, and then there's also like the antigen versus the genetic ones. So when we're talking about things like smallpox or, you know, you've probably heard about it and, and Dr. User and O'Shaughnessy and all, they, there are certain vaccines you don't give pregnant women, right? And the reason for that is these are live attenuated or they have the potential in the right person with the right beat up immune system that they can actually cause disease. They can actually replicate in that human body. And we used to do this. So anybody who knows people or is old enough, oral polio was a big player where we're actually like ingesting weak live polio. You were shedding it out the GI system and you know people around you could get vaccinated just from you having a bowel movement, you know? So yeah, you don't want people that are immunocompromised on chemotherapy or pregnant around that unless they're protected for polio. And so smallpox is one of these ways that we do that. We're using a vaccinia vector, which is a full virus. It has some immunoreproductive capability in a human when you give that vaccine. So you're, if, once you get reproduction in a body, you can actually shed it. And then that can infect somebody else who's susceptible, whether it's pregnancy or whatever. These vaccines, uh -uh. it's not even in the same ballpark. There's just, it, there's just no mechanism. You're not, you're not dealing with full virus in any shape or form. There's no way to generate a, a full virus. So as Dr. O'Shaughnessy and user and everybody has said, you are just given a little snippet of an outside of that virus just to make the antibody response in it. That is not infectious. That's not contagious. You can't shed that. You're not making it enough to do it. So they're, they're completely different. So you got to think about what the mechanism is. I hope that explained the answer. <laughs> that was fantastic. Thank you. And then just again, to piggyback off of that, the vaccines we do not recommend in pregnancy would be any live vaccine. So in this country, that would be the varicella vaccine or chickenpox vaccine or the measles, mumps, rubella vaccine. So those are the two that we specifically try very hard and it would be considered kind of a, a poor a poor outcome if you gave that vaccine to a pregnant woman. So those are the two vaccines that we talk about when we talk about live vaccines that we avoid in pregnancy. Otherwise, vaccines in pregnancy are safe and we use them in many different ways. And just to add to the whole menstrual irregularity thing, um, um, even, if, even if this virus was shed, uh, like a live virus, it would not cause menstrual irregularities. So I don't even know how one would cause the other, but obviously it's not a live virus. So even, in, even more reason why that would not be the case. So again, these are all anecdotal stories. These are people talking about other people who are talking about their mother or their sister. You know, this is how these things spread, unfortunately. So. Yeah. No, absolutely. Okay, we got two minutes left. Does anybody have a question they want to throw on in there? Oh, I see somebody's camera came on. Hi. Hi, I just wanted to, um, I don't have another question. I sent in quite a few questions and they all got answered. Um, I just want to thank you guys for doing this Zoom. Um, as somebody who's, I'm not, I'm not a scientist, I'm not in the health world, um, and there's so much information out there that is really confusing um, for the average people out there. So thank you so much for answering the questions in such detail. I made probably eight pages of notes. <laughs> um, so I just wanted to come on and just say thank you so much for um, being able to do this and just spending some of your time um, 
helping us out. So thank you so much. <laughs> It looks like somebody's medical in your world. I see some MCAT books behind you. So. Oh yeah, my husband's studying med school soon, but I, I don't understand anything he says. So oh. <laughs> this was much simpler. I'm glad it was helpful for you. Thank you. <laughs> I love it, I love it. All right, anybody else? Maybe the auctioneer say going, going, gone. Oh. Thank you, huge thank you to all four of you. I know Dr. Wilson, you you, you hid from us, but thank you to you as well. Um, but, uh, I really do appreciate that all of you, I mean, in the background, I've learned so much, you know, just as I was setting this up and you all did such an incredible job of making it understandable and accessible. And I'm, I'm hopeful that it will be helpful to people. If anybody is watching this, later when we put up on our website. If you send questions to us through Colorado Fertility Advocates, I am certain that our panelists, if I root them out, would be happy to help answer them as well in the future, because we really want to make sure that everybody understands, has the information so that they can make educated decisions going forward. So excellent. So thank you all. Thank you for hosting. Absolutely. You did a great My job. Pleasure. <laughs> <laughs>